uh, welcome everyone uh, to uh, um, Cork Astronomy Club's monthly meeting. Now I'm going to introduce our speaker. Anne-Marie Madigan is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Colorado, uh, where it is early afternoon uh, and Cork Astronomy Club is privileged uh, to welcome her to our meeting tonight and very grateful that she's taken the time out of a of a busy day, busy working day to talk to us. A lecture is going to be called No Need for Planet Nine. And I found out just earlier this evening uh, that she was actually born in Dublin. I didn't realize that when uh, uh, we first arranged that she would be here tonight. Anne Marie was born in Dublin and went to uh, uh, NUI Galway. Uh, she specialises in the dynamics of stars and gas near massive black holes, particularly those occurring in the galactic centre of, of our own galaxy and the Andromeda nucleus and in post-stardust galaxies. She also has an interest in exoplanets and, for the purpose of tonight, very relevantly, she is interested in the strange orbits of icy bodies in the outer solar system. And that's what she'll be uh, concentrating on tonight. So, Anne-Marie, thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight. You're going to be talking to us about No Need for Planet Nine. Some of you may not even have heard of Planet Nine. Well, if you haven't, you're just about to, and you're just about to <laughs> find out why there's actually no need to hear about it. <laughs> so, Anne-Marie, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay, well, thank you so much for asking me to come and chat. Uh, as Peter said, I'm actually from Dublin, uh, which is why I assumed you asked me to, to talk, actually. But you were like, oh, an Irish person abroad. Um, I've been gone a long time, so if my accent seems a little odd, that's, that's my excuse. Um, so what I want to uh, talk about today is the weird things that are going on in our very outer solar system. So specifically, there are lots of bodies, small icy bodies beyond the orbit of Neptune. And the orbits or the paths that they take around the sun are doing something really unexpected. So one explanation for this is planet nine. But what I'm talking about today is why we do not need a planet nine. And this is a hypothetical new giant planet in our outer solar system to explain all these puzzles. So I'll step through what it is that's going on in our outer solar system, and then the two leading theories to, to explain it. But I am gonna be talking about the orbits of bodies. Um, and so of course, I wanna just make sure we're all on this, the same page and just dis discuss how do we actually describe an orbit in our solar system? Uh, how do bodies change the orbits that they're on? And then I'll get onto um, why it's so odd um, the observations we're making in the outer solar system, so the, the very outer reaches um, beyond the orbit of Neptune. Okay, so first just a few slides to go through how do we actually describe the orbit or a path a body takes around the sun. So in what we call a, a Keplerian system, named after Johannes Kepler, that's a system where you're dominated by one huge body, which is in our case, the sun, bodies move along elliptical paths, ellipses, right? So I'm just showing a schematic here. And you have this long axis, it's called a major axis. And that describes basically like how big is the orbit that you're on. And then if we take half of that, it's called the semi-major axis. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. Um, and this will be listed for bodies in the outer solar system, their semi-major axes. And they're often values of 100, even 1,000 AU where one AU is the difference, distance between the sun and the earth. So if we want to describe the shape that an orbit makes as it moves around the sun, uh, we need to think about whether or not it's more circular or more elongated. And to do that, we often talk about the semi-minor axis, or most commonly, we actually refer to the eccentricity. So the eccentricity is related to the semi-minor minor axis and semi-major axis using this equation here. So eccentricity is equal to the square root of one minus b squared over a squared. You don't need to, to remember this at all, but this is just to say that if your semi-minor axis is very small, you're on a really elongated orbit, that b squared over a squared goes to zero, and so your eccentricity is near one. But if your semi-minor axis is quite similar to your semi-major axis, that just means you're on a circular orbit, 
you can see therefore the eccentricity is going to be close to zero. So this is actually going to be on, on a plot I show in a couple of slides. Um, and the next couple of things you might hear in this talk, one is aphelion. So if this is the sun that I have depicted here by a yellow dot, aphelion is the position furthest away from the sun that you ever make when you're along your orbit. And in contrast, perihelion is the closest approach you ever make to the sun. And perihelion is given by semi-major axis multiplied by one minus eccentricity. And I'm gonna show that equation again, because it turns out to be really important for bodies in the very outer solar system, what their perihelion distance is, how close do they get to the sun? Okay, so that's an orbit in 2D, meaning you know you just have some orbital plane and then semi-major axis eccentricity can describe the size of the orbit and also the shape. But we also want to be able to describe the orientation that an, or an orbit makes in space. So we have the midplane of the solar system, but how is this orbit um, configured? How does it relate to that midplane? So to explain how you uh, describe an orbit in space, I like to use an analogy of a boat. Um, so if you imagine, or a boat on an airplane, if you imagine taking a rope along the outside of this boat and say, this is gonna be my orbit, as the body is going to move around on this rope. You can see, therefore, that just like a boat or a plane, your orbit actually has three defined rotation angles. So you can pitch over your major axis. You can roll, sorry, pitch over your minor axis, roll over your major axis like you would on a boat. And then the final rotation is yaw, where just like redirect where you're pointing your boat or your orbit. Um, so these are really intuitive rotation angles to describe an orbit. This is not what astronomers use. We use what's called Kepler elements just for historical reasons, um, but I'll relate them to each other. Um, so the first is inclination or I. An inclination is basically by how much are you pitching or rolling with respect to the plane of the solar system. So a very highly inclined orbit would be one where this is the plane of the solar system and you're like this, or you might be like this. It is rolled or pitched or a combination of both by a large amount. And as you go get outwards in the solar system, those inclination angles start to become quite, um, quite extreme. The next uh, angle is some horrible name like argument of perihelion. Um, but this is actually really important for bodies in the outer solar system. This is one of the, the, uh, the surprising discoveries that was made recently of what bodies are, the, the orbits are doing in the outer solar system, but they, they have similar values of this little omega. So omega, the best way to explain that is if you take how much you're pitching and divide it by how much you're rolling, you get an omega value. So if two two orbits have the same omega value. You can picture it like you have two boats on the ocean and they might be facing each other or facing the same direction, that doesn't matter. But if you take a snapshot of them and just say with respect to you know, the, the flat ocean, um, they're both pitching forward a boat rolling to the right. That would mean they would have the same omega value. And so if you were to take a photo of two boats doing that on the ocean, you might be like, okay, that's, that's fine. That makes sense. Um, if you take a photo of 100 boats and they're all doing that, no matter where they are in the ocean, you would be really surprised. You would think, well, some of them should be actually pitched backward or rolling to the left, or at least they shouldn't be all doing it by the same amount. So um, I'll explain in the, the next couple of slides that bodies in the outer solar system are actually on orbits that will have the same omega value. It's, it's really odd. The final... Kepler element or orientation angle of an orbit is uh, what we refer to as comega. I think it's because it's like a, a pi and an omega combined. And that's basically where is the nose of your boat or the nose of your orbit facing? And so if bodies have the same omega value, they're all pointing in the same direction. Okay, if we need to use these again, I'll bring them up. You don't have to remember anything. This is just to give you a, an overview of these, um, of how we describe orbits. So then I want to get to how would you change the orbit of a body in the solar system? And actually, a, a lot of these dynamics um, apply to other systems like systems of stars around supermass black holes and things like that. But we're just focused on the solar system in this talk. 
So the first way you can change the orbit of a body in the solar system, let's say this is the sun in yellow, and this is a body coming near perihelion, is something called gravitational scattering. So let's say we suddenly have a massive perturber, a, a massive body nearby, it can exert a gravitational force on this uh, blue body. That means it will scatter the body and move it onto a different orbit. So it's highly exaggerated here, what I've, what I've done. Um, and that will change the size and the shape of the orbit. But you'll notice the body doesn't actually ever just jump instantaneously. So it will change its orbit, but it will move smoothly back to the place it actually um, experienced the gravitational force. What's actually like really, really important uh, for what I work on, but, it, but also in the outer solar system, is something a little more complicated than gravitational scattering, which you can think of as just kind of some instantaneous gravitational force acting on a body that makes uh, it change its orbit. This is something called gravitational torquing. And so to explain what I mean by this, you can picture you have two bodies in orbit around the sun. And let's say like they're two asteroids. They're really, really small. They may never come close to each other as they move in orbit around the sun, but because they move in the same orbit for a really, really long time, again and again and again, mapping out the same orbit or path and space around the sun, over a really, really long time scale, uh, those orbits can gravitationally interact with each other and change each other's shape. And so you can think as a conceptual device how this works, is that you take the mass of that asteroid, you actually spread it out along its orbit. And so you have systems of masses, massive ellipses they're actually gravitationally interacting with each other or gravitationally torquing each other. And that really efficiently changes their shapes and, or changes their eccentricity. That A there is semi-major axis and E is eccentricity. And so the last thing I want to say that's just relevant for this talk is that if you are a body in orbit around the sun and there's nothing else in the universe, you will trace out exactly the same path around the sun for all time. Your orbit would never change. Uh, and we're used to thinking about this, like the Earth's orbit is not changing on human time scales, but, but it, it actually does on longer time scales because it's not just the Earth and the Sun and the universe, Jupiter in particular causes perturbations. And what happens is you take an orbit and it doesn't perfectly close because of those perturbations from, for example, Jupiter, it processes. And that's just this opening out, not perfectly closing, just over a long time scale, just kind of opening out in this rosette picture. And you may have heard about this with um, the precession of the orbit of Mercury. This is one of these anomalies, I think in the early 1900s, um, the, the theory of general relativity actually solved because general relativity can, can make orbits precess as well. Okay, and that changes the orientation of an ellipse or this Pomega Valley, where is your orbit pointing on the sky? Okay, so with that background, I wanna talk about the mysteries going on in our outer solar system, because we, we have all the, the language that we need uh, to understand that now. So what I'm showing here is a schematic of our solar system. So very simplified. So on the horizontal axis, I've put the semi-major axis of orbits, the size of the orbits bodies are on. Um, and I've done this in a log scale. So you see here, Earth is at one AU by definition. Um, we've got 10 AU is around where Saturn and then Uranus and Neptune are, 100 AU going out to 1000 AU. And then on this vertical axis, I've got this, the um, shape of the orbit. So zero is for a really circular orbit. Um, one is for a really, really elongated orbit. And so you can see uh, all the planets have roughly circular orbits. And then we get to Pluto at the end here. It actually has a significant eccentricity. Pluto is not a planet, it's a dwarf planet, and it's part of a distribution of icy bodies known as the Kuiper Belt that extends from about 30 to 50 AU in our solar system. The beginning of where Neptune is at a little bit further. Um, so extending out of the Kuiper Belt is something called the scattered disk. So these are also uh, icy bodies we often refer to them as planetesimals, just like baby planets, basically, um, thinking about like where they came from. So we think these bodies 
came from the original protoplanetary disk or the disk out of which all the planets formed, but they never made it into planets. They're just being moved around the solar system. Um, and you can think of them being uh, Pluto sized all the way down to well, dust particles, but asteroids and comets are all included in, in what these bodies are. Now, the weird thing about the scattered disk, I'm sure you've noticed, is that all the bodies follow this line. So they extend actually much further. Now we know scattered disk bodies extend up to 1000 AU, but they will follow this line. And what is this line? This is a, a line of constant perihelion, where, which is 30 AU. That means if you are a body on this line, even if your orbit gets larger in semi-major axis space, and your eccentricity increases, or you get more radial, your perihelion distance, the closest approach you make to the sun, is still 30 AU, okay, if you move along this line. And the reason uh, we see bodies move along this line in the solar system is because they spend most of their time in their orbit really far out in the outer solar system, hundreds of AU, but then near their perihelion distance, they can meet Neptune and Neptune can scatter them. And when Neptune scatters them, they can move onto an even larger orbit, an even more elongated orbit, but they don't just jump position. So they, that orbit that they move onto still contains that position where they got scattered. And so they always come back such that their perihelion distance is roughly the same. And so we see these bodies and they were actually theoretically predicted. Um, this field is really new. So I think the first scattered disk object which you can think of being kind of like Pluto sized or smaller, uh, wasn't just discovered until late 1990s. So still a very young field. There's many of them detected now, uh, hundreds, I would say at this point. The weird things that we're gonna be focused on for this talk are a population of bodies that we call detached objects, All right? So these were not theoretically expected and a real surprise when we first started detecting them. So what are detached objects? So these are bodies that are, live in the same region of space, uh, hundreds of AU as the scattered disk objects. They look similar. We can't get really good snapshots of them, um, but we can take them in all different filters um, and we can figure out kind of roughly what mass they should be. Um, but what's weird about them is that they're not, they don't belong to the scattered disk. So they're perihelion distances because you can see here, you know, perihelion distance here is 30 AU. As you move downwards, you get to lower eccentricities, which actually means your perihelion is bigger. All these bodies have really, really, really large perihelion distances. Uh, one such body I'll introduce in a couple of slides actually has a perihelion distance of 80 AU. So that means that its closest approach to the sun never gets any closer. It's at 80 AU, whereas Neptune is at 30. So it never interacts with the inner solar system. We don't think they formed out there. There would never have been enough mass to form little planetesimals out there. So where did they come from? How did they get out there? Um, and there's, there's many other mysteries that I'll, I'll mention in a moment. I want to give you an idea of the scale. So I, that was just a schematic that I'd made myself, but I want you to get a, a feel for like, just how big and how odd are these orbits? So here's a, a kind of a face down view of the solar system. So we have Earth here in green, Mars, the asteroid belt depicted in yellow here, and then we have Jupiter. We're gonna zoom out and you see we have Saturn in yellow, Uranus in green, Neptune, and then Pluto, Pluto being a part of that Kuiper belt. And so this is, this is all the solar system that we were pretty familiar with. Here is one of those detached bodies in the upper right-hand corner in red, and its name is Sedna. And so you might think if it's similar to the rest of the solar system, it's just on a bit of a bigger orbit. So maybe it will just like map out an orbit that looks like that Pluto's orbit in purple, but just a bit bigger. But this is the orbit of Sedna, just to give you an idea of just how different uh, this orbit is compared to the bodies we know of in the inner solar system. So the orbit of Sedna is so large that it takes Sedna over 10,000 years to travel once around the sun. And you can see it's on this extremely elongated orbit. And the point I'm trying to make with the detached orbits is that at no point on its orbit around the sun does it come close 
to that blue line of Neptune. So it's a bit of a mystery of how it got out there. Want to point out this is always kind of shocking. I'm a theorist, so I kind of forget uh, just how difficult the observations um, it is to take observations of these objects. So this bigger image here is a beautiful art, artist's impression of Sedna. Uh, we do know it's quite red in color, and we can get that information just from taking uh, images in different wavelengths or different filters. So it's a bit like Mars uh, in how red it is. Um, and we can also know just how bright the sun would be at the average distance of Sedna on its orbit. And so this is in the, like, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this here uh, on the right-hand side of the image, the brightest star, that's what the sun would look like because it's that far away um, when you're, when you're Sedna. Um, but this uh, smaller inset image is, the image of Sedna taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And so that's a, it's a pretty impressive telescope that we have. And this is the best image you can take. Um, it's so small an image that we're not able to resolve anything like a moon. And so we don't have a great handle on the mass of Sedna, but we think it's something on the order of like a little bit less than, than Pluto's mass. So it's not a planet, it's a dwarf planet. Okay, um, I'm gonna, uh, show you uh, the plot from a scientific paper that really launched a new field in 2014, um, where they took uh, just a handful of these bodies, detached objects, and they looked at one of the orientation angles that their the orbits make the midplane of the solar system. And so here, on the x-axis of the semi-major axis, so that's the, the size of the orbit in AU, Again, Earth is down at one, uh, Neptune is at 30. So these are bodies really, really far out in the outer solar system. You see Sedna here on the right-hand side. And then on the y-axis, we have this Kepler element it's called argument of perihelion. But to remind you what it means is taking an orbit by how much is an orbit pitching forward or backward divided by how much is it rolling left or right. Okay. And so you would expect for a bunch of orbits, you would expect all values of omega. It goes from zero to two pi. If you're scattering off giant planets and moving on to new orbits, you expect that to be very random. And that's what we see in the data. These All these black points are small bodies in our solar system, in the outer solar system, so beginning at Neptune. And you can see out until maybe about 150 AU, the bodies have a large range in omega values as expected. But then once you get beyond that value, so the most extreme bodies, uh, you see Sedna here. Uh, there's also a body here called 2012 BP113. Um, this is nicknamed Biden because it was discovered when Biden was vice president. Um, you can see that all of these bodies here start to cluster in their values of omega. Really weird. Here, I'm just showing you an idealized version of what it looks like when you cluster orbits in these omega values. So in this image, I've made all of the bodies pitch forward by the same amount and roll to the right. That's what it looks like. And it's not something we expected to see anywhere in a solar system. So that's just to get, give you an idea of like one paper showing um, some really weird things going on in the, the, the detached objects in the outer solar system. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna tell you <laughs> about the rest of them. Um, oh, of course, the, the first one, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead. I should say, uh, I'm saying minor planet mysteries. Minor planet is a, an old term that encompasses basically everything that's not a planet. So everything that's smaller than a planet. So it can be dwarf planets, asteroids, comets, all the way down to, to lead that to rocks. Um, so these are bodies in the outer solar system, these minor planets. And there's four, maybe five, I'll mention one more, uh, odd things that their orbits are doing. So the first one, as I've mentioned, is that they appear detached. And that just means their perihelion distances are so large that they never interact with any of the giant planets in the solar system. And it's interactions with giant planets that should scatter you right there. Uh, so we don't, we don't understand how they actually got out there because they're not actually interacting with the giant planets. Um, the second thing I'll just mention, but not actually show any of the data is that some of them have extraordinarily uh, high inclinations. 
So there's one that's nicknamed Kaju, one little minor planet that has an inclination of 54 degrees with respect to the midplane of the solar system. And that, that shouldn't happen with the standard idea of bodies, little minor planets being scattered by giant planets. You can get out to maybe 40 in extreme cases, uh, in, inclinations. You shouldn't get above 40. The third thing is the clustering in little omega or the, the way the orbits are tilting with respect to the midplane of the solar system, as I've explained. And the fourth thing that I'm gonna introduce is that there's clustering in physical space or this, um, this value of Kepler element, which is called Pomega. Uh, I'll explain what that looks like on the next slide, but I just want to introduce the, I would say like the main uh, hypothesis to date that has been introduced to explain what is going on out there. How can all these orbits um, taken together have all of these unusual characteristics? And so, um, this hypothesis is the planet line hypothesis. And this was um, brought out in 2016 to say there's a new planet in the outer solar system that is kind of, uh, don't want to say it's a bully, but kind of like shoving all the orbits of smaller bodies onto these really weird orientations. Okay, so um, I'll explain a little bit more of that. But at first, I want to show what does clustering in Pomega or physical clustering look like? Um, and so this is a really good image to show that, and it's taken from the paper in 2016. So the orbits of minor planets are shown in purple, and we've discovered many more since 2016, um, but th this is what we had in 2016. So you can see there is Sedna, um, here is Biden again, the 2012 BP113. Um, and if you look at all of their orbits and you kind of look at a face down view, you can see they're not randomly distributed on the sky. They are clustered together. They're all pointing in the same way. And what these authors suggest is um, that there is a new planet in the outer solar system. And if it has just the right orbit, it will be able to kind of shove the orbits of smaller bodies onto the other half of the sky, make them tilt in the same way. It also changes their eccentricities so that they could start off in the scattered disk, their eccentricities would drop and their perihelia distance would increase and they would detach naturally from the inner solar system. It also explains the high inclinations of these bodies. So it's a really great explanation um, for, for just kind of figuring out everything that's going on out there. It does have to have the right orbit and that orbit, if planet nine exists, is very odd for a planet. So this orbit of planet nine, it needs to be having a semi-major axis of hundreds of AU. And I think the best fit orbit right now is something like 500 AU. Um, and just contrast that with the planets we know of in our solar system. They go from Mercury, that's about 0.3 AU. I don't know if I have that right off the top of my head, but something smaller than an AU, of course, out to 30 AU. So, so a planet all of a sudden at 500 AU is very different. It also can't be on a circular orbit like the rest of the planets. It has to have an eccentricity of maybe 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. So actually quite similar to Pluto, but this is a much more massive planet. It needs to be a super Earth or a sub-Neptune. So something on the order of six to 10 times the mass of the Earth. And then finally, the last thing that this orbit needs to have is an inclination of maybe about 20 degrees. So it can't be like the other planets are, it can't be in the midplane of the solar system moving around like this, it has to be on an orbit that's inclined. And so it's a really nice hypothesis and it's extremely testable because of course this planet, if it's there, um, we will be able to detect it given good enough data. Um, one major problem, other than the fact that we haven't detected it, is uh, it's very difficult to understand how it got there shouldn't form out there. It itself would need to have formed either in our solar system and be kicked out, uh, but the orbit changed in such a way to pr produce what we need it today, or it needs to be captured from another solar system, or maybe it's a captured free flo floating planet. All of these ideas have been proposed. Um, so either way, if it's detected it is extremely exciting, um, but <laughs> I, I don't think we need a planet nine, and I'm sure you're not too surprised to hear me say that because that's the, the title of my talk. So 
uh, oh, these are the the um, the best fit orbital parameters for Planet Nine to date. They 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 change as we discover new data. Um, what my group in Bowler has been suggesting is that the odd things that we see going out in the uh, on in the outer solar system are due to the minor planets themselves self-organizing. And so what do I mean by that? You can think of, um, for example, if you look at a galaxy, a disk galaxy that has spiral arms. Spiral arms are a result of billions of stars all working together under their own collective gravity to form these fantastic structures in a rotating disk galaxy. We don't look at spiral arms in a disk galaxy and think uh, maybe there is a massive object that, that's causing these spiral arms. And so in the same way in our outer solar system, there should be self-organization of small bodies, but we don't see them uh, because they don't shine like stars. But now that we're delving deeper into the outer solar system with better telescopes, with large sky surveys, um, I think we're seeing the hints, uh, like the tip of the iceberg of the population. And they're doing some really odd things out there, which we can actually explain. So for this theory, uh, we use what's called n-body simulations. And so n-body simulations, uh, the n refers to just the number of particles you use in your computer. And so what we use is um, the sun, right? Because we're in orbit around the sun. And then we take bodies that have been scattered out by the giant planets in the scattered disk. And so we populate scattered disk bodies moving on these very eccentric orbits around the sun. And we also include the gravity of the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune in our computer simulation. And uh, we, we step forward in time and we go to about 800 million years is the amount we've managed to simulate for, but obviously we want to go for longer, 4.5 giga years would be nice. Um, but what that code does is take all these initial conditions and all the initial orbits we've placed everything on and move forward in time, move all the bodies in a computer simulation, stop. And for each body, we'll look at every other body and say, what is the gravitational acceleration and gravitational force you're exerting on me? And how will that change my orbit? And then I'll move forward again for a tiny little time step. And in that way, uh, with like bodies all moving forward in time, stopping and checking where each other are and then changing each other's orbits, we can actually see, given these initial conditions, what would we expect the system to be doing at a later time? It's extremely computationally expensive. Um, <laughs> I don't really have a but at the end of that sentence, uh, but I guess the but is that's what we can do right now. Uh, we're trying to think of better ways to approach the system. And I can always ask, answer questions on that later if anybody's interested in what other types of techniques we can use. Um, oh yeah, so this is a kind of a top-down image of our initial setup. The sun, orbits of the giant planets, and then scattered disk bodies on these eccentric orbits. And there's many um, particles in our simulation going from hundreds up to about a thousand. So I'm just going to show you um, the uh, movies basically from these simulations. So this is what the, the outskirts of our solar system would look like if you were able to see all of these small bodies, right? And right now we cannot see all of these small bodies. We can only see actually a few of them, but hopefully at a later date, we'll be able to actually find more. And so you're going to see um, these movies step through in time. On the left-hand side, you see a side-on view to our solar system. And I'm just plotting the positions of the minor planets, not actually the giant planets. And the sun is, the location of the sun is that cross in the center. Um, the scale here is AU. So we simulate from about, about zero to about a thousand AU in our solar system, but we're just zooming into the central few hundred AU because that's where most of the bodies are located. So we see a side view on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you're gonna see a top 10 view. Now, what you would expect, oh, and I, I should say the, the color bar is um, something called normalized surface density. But you can just think of it like when it's yellow, there are more bodies, and when it's purple, there are fewer bodies. Now, what you would expect on the left-hand side, I'll play first, if all of these bodies were in very circular orbits, you should just expect that disk to get puffier. 
But because these bodies are all on very eccentric orbits, there's actually an instability that gets triggered in this system. And this is, this is fairly new um, results. This is from one of my papers in 2016. So we're all familiar with exponential growth because of COVID. Well, this is an instability and there's exponential growth in the inclination angles that the bodies make with respect to the midplane of the solar system. So let me run the simulation. Oh, right. Uh, you're gonna see time scale in units of the secular time. It's not important for the purposes of this talk. You can just know that one secular time here equals about 1.6 million years, or you can round it off to 2 million years. So every time you see one T secular, it's about 2 million years. So let me play it. So you see all the bodies are interact with, interacting with each other. And what's happened is all the orbits have gone down like this um, because it was a, an instability as all the bodies are interacting with each other. It's actually those gravitational torques acting between the orbits that cause this instability. I'm gonna play the right-hand side for you. What you're gonna see at the same time that all these bodies incline off the plane, it actually looks like the disc might shrink a little bit, kind of get narrower. And what that is, is that all the bodies go from being very eccentric to getting more circular. And at the same time, they actually detach from the inner solar system. Their perihelion distances get larger as they get really eccentric to more circular. So I'll play both of those together again. Hopefully they will play. No, let me just go like this at the same time. For anybody who's really interested in galaxies, uh, you know, stellar bars you might see in galaxies, these like elongated features and some disk galaxies that you see, they can actually buckle or like incline off the plane as well. So there's a lot of similarities between what you're seeing here on the left-hand side and what goes on in a galaxy. And again, it's just driven uh, by the collective gravity of individually low mass, but collectively very massive groups of bodies. Okay, let's relate this to the observations in the outer solar system. So um, in the simulation, you saw this type of feature where all of the orbits incline off the plane. They can either go this way or this way, 50-50 chance which one they'll do. Um, this is what clustering in little omega looks like. So you remember that paper from 2014 that showed clustering of values. We actually reproduce this in our simulations and we understand why. Um, the next thing on the right-hand side is clustering in the physical space or clustering in omega. Um, and so this is what it looks like when you're looking at one of these movies. Um, it's where the yellow distributed around the orbit is actually lopsided. You don't have a smooth distribution. And that means orbits are collectively pointing in one area of the sky rather than another. And so we reproduce the clustering in Pomega or, or the tilt uh, and clustering in the orbital physical space. Just like there's no planet nine z z z the, these simulations, it's just collective gravity. Um, comparing what we're seeing again to galaxies, I've taken this really nice image. I'm guessing it's a Hubble Space Telescope image of a, a spiral galaxy, NGC 1300, um, where you see these beautiful spiral arms, but you also see this elongated feature in the center. This is what I was saying was, it's called a stellar bar. And this is just made up of orbits that are on these really elongated, or stars that are made on these really elongated orbits, but the orbits are all trapped together. So as the galaxy rotates, so does the bar. And so you always get this enhancement in luminosity in this kind of elongated shape. And we've actually in a recent paper explained that clustering we see in physical space in our simulations using uh, uh, Lyndon Bell, who's a British astronomer. In 1979, he explained how to form bars. And we found we can actually use exactly this um, mechanism that he's described in our solar system to explain why orbits of bodies in the outer solar system actually want to cluster together. But in our solar system, you don't get this bar shape, you get this kind of lopsided configuration where all of the orbits are facing in the same direction. Um, and I just wanted to point out that this is um, not the only place we see clustering of orbits, um, not just in bars and potentially in our outer solar system. This is the very center on the right-hand side of the Andromeda galaxy, 
or it's also called M31. So this is scales of a few light years. Um, and this was really unexpected when it was discovered because you would expect to have a single system of stars. It's kind of this round ball of stars around a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. But instead you saw this kind of double nucleus. So what this is, is actually, um, there's a supermassive black hole in the center of the system. And there's about 10 million stars around the supermassive black hole, but they're all on a line, <laughs> aligned elongated orbits. Um, so very similar to what we're finding in our outer solar system. And again, just due to the collective gravity of the bodies there. So um, to get to the end of my talk, uh, these are the minor planet mysteries that I brought up before happening in the outer solar system. Um, with one new one that uh, I'll mention in a second. So the first, the, the fact that these bodies beyond Neptune appear detached in that their perihelia distances are really, really large and we don't know how they got out there. Uh, we can explain that if all these bodies started off in a scattered disk, but as they undergo this inclination instability, I haven't actually used that phrase before, undergo this instability, that means they all lift off the disk. At the same, their same time, their eccentricities all get more circular or this value of E gets lower. And when your E value drops lower your eccentricity, your semi-major axis stays the same. This means your perihelion distance actually increases. So you start with a body where your perihelion distance is, is attached or uh, comes close to Neptune. And then just through the gravitational interactions with other minor planets, your perihelion distance grows until you can get to such an orbit like Sedna's where at no point along your orbit do you actually interact with Neptune anymore. Uh, we reproduce high inclinations because as I said, there's exponential growth in the inclinations. So we reach average values of about 55 degrees. Um, so we can really easily explain why they, they all have very high inclinations. We reproduce the clustering in omega, that's that, that thing, uh, clustering in omega or physical space, which we explain using Linden Bell's mechanism for creating bars and galaxies. And then the fifth one I've added in is it's very new observational results. Um, I think I won't explain it too much at all, but just to say there is an, there's another weird thing that we've recently found going on, observers, I should say, a thing going on with the bodies in the uh, outer solar system beyond Neptune. Um, and we can also reproduce that. Planet Nine has a hard time doing that. Now, we don't get all this for free. You need to have a lot of minor planets all working together. And so a, a prediction of our theory is that there should be a new belt in our solar system. So like the asteroid belt, like the Kuiper belt, this kind of disk of um, low mass bodies, we should have another disk of bodies um, beyond the orbit of Neptune and beyond the Kuiper belt. Um, and, and we need to have it be very massive. So roughly 10 Earth masses of minor planets out there. So right now we only see a handful, um, Sedna and Biden and all of these other, uh, other minor planets that are doing some really weird things, but we're predicting that this is, again, just the tip of the iceberg, that when we um, look a little deeper, and that's hard to do, uh, we'll actually be detecting a new belt in our outer solar system, and it's collective gravity is causing all this uh, really interesting structure out there. So um, I will end with saying that once again, we do not actually need a planet nine to reproduce what we see, um, or the observations, that astronomers are making in the outer solar system. Um, but we don't get this for free. We do need a lot of mass out there. Um, and I should say uh, that one of the reasons I really like this as opposed to the planet nine theory, um, aside from the fact that it's just my theory and you get very involved in your own work, um, is that we were not uh, hypothesizing something new in the solar system. So when the giant planets formed or when all the planets formed in the early solar system, there was a lot of planetesimals or minor planets left over and they scattered out some to the Oort cloud, some into this region, um, some got trapped in the asteroid belt and some got trapped in the Kuiper belt. And so we don't need anything new in our solar system. We just need to account for the gravitational forces between those bodies. Now, um, if it's there, this new belt in the outer solar system, these bodies are in pretty high inclination orbits. And so they would actually be a source of high inclination comets uh, or Halley type comets 
in fact, if anybody is being interested in heliotype comets, they're um, a distribution of comets uh, that don't have a good known source at the moment because they're very high inclination, but they're not isotropic on the sky, so we don't think they're coming from the Oerklid. But this would actually be a really good source for the heliotype comets. For future work, um, I'm showing here an image of the Vera Rubin Observatory. So this is a new observatory that's being built right now in Chile. And uh, it is going to be starting in 2023 uh, with a 10-year um, survey of the southern sky. And it is going to be absolutely amazing for solar system astronomy. It's going to be able to detect uh, not just bodies in the outer solar system, but many bodies in the inner solar system. If there is a planet nine, or if there is a new belt in the outer solar system, the Vera Rubin Observatory is going to find it. We'd have to be extraordinarily unlucky uh, for that not to be the case. And, and so we're making predictions for the Vera Rubin Observatory. Where should it best look? What's the best cadence? Things like that. And then finally, um, with a grad student here, we're also thinking of applying this kind of collective gravity approach to exoplanet systems. So let's say in our solar system, there really is a planet nine. Let's say we, we are not uh, we are we're not the explanation for our own solar system, for example, if that were to be the case. Um, it's a bit like, you know, if our galaxy didn't have spiral arms. They're like, okay, fine, but other galaxies should have spiral arms. So in the same vein, we're thinking other other planetary systems will have these collective gravity effects. Um, and so we're trying to think like, okay, what will that look like for us to be observing from Earth? Um, and so there's uh, the other predictions that we're making. So I'll stop here and uh, take any questions. Thanks for having me again. Um, so now we can uh, take as uh, many questions as you can. And I'm going to abuse my privilege, as I sometimes do by asking the same, the, the first question. And what I want to say to you, Anne-Marie, is that I'm absolutely in awe that you or Kepler or anyone is able to trace out the orbits of planets and minor planets and asteroids at all, because all you can see from down here is a two-dimensional trace in the sky. And how you succeed in converting that two-dimensional trace into an actual orbit, and then giving us a bird's eye view, which you did in, 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 in one of your slides, and you showed us a video of uh, the solar system from on top. I'm just in awe. I don't, know, I'm, I, I don't suppose you, you'll have the capability to explain to someone a very little brain power like myself tonight how this is done but I'm just in awe that it can be done. I can definitely jump in and say I too am in awe. I do not do this myself. Um, so I, I am a theorist. I'm not allowed near telescopes because I'm absolutely useless uh, with them. Um, but but as I understand it though these these orbits take years um, to build up to, to get a good handle on the orbit. So many of these bodies, you know, like the, the one that I said was nicknamed Biden, it was discovered in 2012. Uh, and the reason it doesn't have an official name yet is because uh, I think it's, it's orbital properties, you know, they're, it's pretty good, but we don't, it's not a total slam dunk. Um, the, the error bars on all of the orbital elements or the orientation angles, you know, they're, they're, they're still a bit too large for it to be officially given a name. Um, so it, it takes years, but one uh, to, to kind of like build up the arc of an orbit to be able to get a really good handle on it. But one thing that the outer solar system objects have in their favor is that we always see them when they're, 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 they're closest to the sun, right? It's just more statistically likely we'll be able to detect them because it's, we don't see their internal radiation, right? We're seeing sunlight reflected off them and coming back. So the closer ones are going to be detected before the, the ones further away. So because we detect them at perihelion or the closest approach to the sun, they're moving the fastest. The bodies as you get closer to the sun are moving faster than bodies further away. Uh, and they're tracing out uh, a smaller arc on the sky. And so it's bodies near perihelion, it, it's faster for us to be able to actually figure out their orbits, but it does require us to, or at least observers to be taking snapshots continuously and to be tracing out the orbits over years to get a really good handle on them. Anne-Marie, first of all, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. 
Mark asked the question, which actually was on my mind as well, which says, will the James Webb Telescope plan to launch next month be utilised for this investigation, or will you be relying pretty solely on the Vera Rubin Observatory? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're all really excited about the JWST. Um, it's going to be launched, we hope, December 18th, but it's going to be like four o'clock in the morning for us here. <laughs> no, <laughs> please no. Um, but we're all going to be watching the launch. Um, so James Webb is going to have really just exquisite resolution. And uh, so time on this telescope is going to be really competitive. And so it really is gonna be reserved for looking at exoplanets and trying to figure out the atmospheres of exoplanets in particular, even when it comes to kind of planetary science, that's what it's really gonna shine at. Uh, what it won't be used for is surveying the sky, just like arbitrary, well not arbitrarily, but pointing to a section of the sky and then moving through it and just seeing if you have to happen to catch things. That's not what it's gonna be used for. There, there are rumors that it could be used to, you know, if there are some planet nine candidates it could be used to zoom in on those candidates you know for if, if we're pretty sure somebody's detected planet nine the jwsd will probably be used for that um but for just surveying the sky and trying to find more bodies in our own solar system it's not going to be jwsd that's definitely going to be more of a rear of ruben thing okay um nick mccreevy poses the question um could Planet Nine have been ejected out of our solar system shortly after the system formed? The answer to that is yes. So we have the four giant planets in our solar system, uh, Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus, <laughs> missed one, Saturn, <laughs> Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And in computer simulations, when you're trying to see, we, we don't think that those planets formed exactly where we see them today. And so in computer simulations, when you're, when you're putting in the giant planets and seeing how they move around in the early solar system, just because they're interacting with lots of these smaller bodies, um, what you find is that if you actually put in a fifth giant planet in that region and it gets ejected by Jupiter, you can reproduce the current modern day solar system much better than without that fifth planet. And so definitely one of the ideas for where the planet line come from is that it actually forms, you know, somewhere in the region of Jupiter or Saturn, it got kicked out um, to, you know, hundreds of AU. The problem with this scenario though, is that it would still be on an orbit that would take a close again, to the giant planet region, that, that perihelion distance, just like that scattered disk I was talking about, should still be roughly the same. So you've got to kick it out, which is fine, but then you've got to change its orbit so that it gets more circular and detaches from the inner solar system. And that's not something anybody has been able to explain. Um, but it's, I, I would say it's the preferred origin story for planet nine. It's just not complete right now. We just don't understand how to get onto the orbit we see it today. Okay, um, more of a suggestion than a, a question, I suppose, but uh, Tony suggests that if a new Kuiper belt is found, he proposes it be called the Madigan belt. <laughs> I agree, I completely agree. <laughs> um, I think astronomy is moving away from just naming everything mm -hmm. after random people or random astronomers. Um, but of course, I think my parents would be delighted. So I would, I would vote for that one too. Okay. Um, another technical question from Brianna, which says, thank you very much for a great talk. While performing the end body simulation to predict the future locations of the bodies, how do you decide the initial conditions, considering we don't have complete information on all the celestial bodies around our solar system? So for example, in the simulation that I was talking about that we do in my group, where we have the sun and we have the giant planets, and then we have scattered disk bodies on these eccentric orbits and we just let it run. What we find is that it's not the location of a body on its orbit at any given time. That's the most important thing. Um, so, you know, you could start Jupiter off here along its orbit. You could start it over here or here or here. What's most important is the orbit itself because over long time scales, it's really just like, uh, like kind of 
think of taking um, time-lapse photo of the system, that's what's important. What are the orbits, shapes, and sizes? And so exactly where they start on their orbits turns out to not be too important. As long as bodies aren't very close together, then they can scatter off each other. So with that caveat, um, think of like taking a long, um, or I, mean, I keep forgetting that phrase, time-lapse image of the system. And it's really about what are the shapes of those orbits? What are the sizes of the orbits? And that really determines how bodies are interacting with each other. So it doesn't matter too much where you start them off. So you can, you can also test this by run a hundred of those simulations where they all have the same orbits, but you just start them at different locations on their orbits and you move forward in time. And you'll find statistically you get the same results. Colin Philpott is wondering, do you think Planet Nine idea took off because it fascinates the general public and not because of the evidence, evidence supports it? That's a fun question. Uh, I think both, definitely both. So I think Planet Nine as a concept really took off because, <laughs> so these are my competitors, I must phrase this correctly. They are very good uh, and they're, they're, they're fantastic scientists. They're very good at the press, very good at the media. And so I think this iteration, this concept of a new planet in the outer solar system, it's not new, but this planet nine, this particular hypothesis that was brought up in 2016 has become so popular um, because of like, knowing how to handle this really well. Um, as for like the data, the evidence probably doesn't support it. There's definitely something going on in the outer solar system, for sure. There, there are all sorts of observational biases um, when you take data of bodies that are so far away, you know, you, you're doing these surveys of the sky, but there's, you know, clouds over there the whole time. And, you know, you're not able to get this perfect, complete map of our solar system. So there's definitely biases that you have to be careful of. But things like the fact that a lot of them have extraordinarily in, uh, high inclinations and they're detached, things like that, you can't explain away through observational bias. So something's going on out there. Planet Nine turns out to be a really good hypothesis for explaining the data. It just, to me, it kind of pushes the problem back, saying like, there is something weird going on out there. If we stick something else weird that we can't understand, we fix it. But now we have to go and try and understand how did the planet get out there? Um, so yeah, I think that that would be my answer. Okay. I think it's a great, a great theory, but also a very good media campaign, which I, I don't disagree with. It's fun. Phil McCahey asks, Given that all the mass and solar system influence each other, does the expanding universe result in continuous changing of your data and therefore your assumptions? The universe is indeed expanding, but on the scales of the solar system, it is, uh, it's not. Um, it's the, it's just on these small scales of our solar system, uh, space time is pretty static. So we don't have to worry about cosmology or anything like that when we're doing our, our work. When we go to the scales of galaxies and things like that, that's when that becomes really important. The solar system is tiny, absolutely tiny. And so um, cosmology doesn't affect it. Um, Linda asks, could a micro black hole account for the crazy elliptical orbits? There was a paper recently enough, I would say maybe two years ago, um, where people proposed that instead of planet nine being a planet, it could be a really, really, really tiny black hole. And what's really, really, really annoying about that theory is that it's not very easy to test. <laughs> so it's kind of like a bit of the, uh, I'll get it wrong if I try and say it off the top of my head, but like the Bertrand Russell teapot around Jupiter. I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about there, but you can come up with anything and stick it out in space. And if it's not testable, uh, you know, it's kind of frustrating. So in theory, yes, planet nine could be a really small black hole. Why it's in orbit around the sun, uh, even like primordial or uh, micro black holes have not actually been detected. So there's other problems with that. Um, but yes, yes, in theory, we could have a little baby black hole in our solar system. But just like the Planet Nine hypothesis itself, you'd have to then be like, well, okay, like how did it get there and why? Um, so it's always, always a possibility, but a very irritating one. Because then if Vera Rubin Observatory doesn't detect Planet Nine, 
people would be able to be like, aha, because it's a black hole. <laughs> John asks, the, the analyst method you have used is somewhat like fin, finite element an, analysts. Why is the other technique you could allude to? Right. Um, so this is the these n-body simulations that I talked about is um, well, what that alludes to is that we kind of we di discretize time. So we kind of we have time steps in our code. We say like, okay, we have a snapshot. Everything's moving. Everything's in this position right now. Let's move everything on their orbits for a really small time step. Let's say like by a month in our system, and then we stop. And then we see what are all the gravitational forces this body is experiencing, calculate an acceleration that changes the velocity. And, and you, you move forward like this in your code. Uh, and it's sometimes extremely complicated. It's not that straightforward what you're doing. You're taking all back steps and all doing all sorts of stuff. Um, but this is a very computationally expensive way to actually start from an initial condition and get to um, a future condition of what your system looks like. So one of the things we're interested in doing, oh, actually, what's more interesting? I'm gonna tell you the more interesting thing that people do. Um, remember I said gravitational torquing is where you get the, the mass of a body and spread it out along its orbit. And you can think of, you have a system of like wires or massive ellipses that are gravitationally interacting with each other. That's a conceptual device that I often use, but some people actually use it in their computers. So instead of having individual little minor planets, they actually take it make a massive wire out of it and then do their calculations on like how are these wires that have mass uh, physically interacting with each other. This is called an N wire code. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out not to be much faster, but I think it's pretty cool. But that's what I'll answer there. The, the next code we're thinking of building is, is complicated. So I might just like, not, not fumble my way through it now. Could the potential yet unknown compression of, of dark matter, excuse me, affect part of your analysis? Again, the, the same answer I would have uh, about cosmology is the same answer I'd have about dark matter. Um, so we know, <laughs> we don't know, we assume that there is dark matter in our solar system, moving throughout our solar system. But on the scale of the solar system, the amount of mass that would be uh, in our solar system that would be dark matter is relatively very, very small. Um, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think of what it would be, but uh, again, it, but, but very small. It's really, you have to get to the scale of galaxies um, or even like much larger than visible galaxies, like 10 times the distance. And that's when dark matter really starts adding up to be something really interesting. Um, so, you know, you can always hypothesize some weird dark matter um, that could change that, that would mean on the scale of, scale of solar systems, there'd be something going on, but I haven't seen anything realistic. We're extremely honoured, Anne-Marie, that uh, you've joined Cork Astronomy Club's meeting tonight. I think we can, all, we can say we've all had uh, an experience that we will long remember appearing from someone who's actually at the cutting edge of um, research and uh, I, I really do hope that one day we shall indeed be reading about a Madigan belt. That, that, that would be good indeed. Um, we're aware that you've taken time out of a busy working day to talk to us. And uh, on behalf of our club, a, a huge thank you. It was, it was lovely to get to see you all. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks very much and good luck. <laughs>